Hello, my friends. Welcome to Fellowship at Home. It is such a joy to be with you. My name is Stormore, one of the pastors on staff, and it is my bigger pleasure to introduce to you my friend, Pastor Rachel Sabayos. Hi, everybody. Good to be with you. Good, good to have you here and be with you in this space. Yeah, it's this, always the best. Yeah, this is going to be this is going to be a, a great, great celebration. We are a gospel-centered, multi-ethnic, intergenerational church, and we exist to make disciples. Yes. And we have some incredible things happening here. As a truly gospel-centered church, uh, we are so excited to be in this series, A Different World, where really we are a people of faith who are continuing the practice of that. And uh, one of the greatest ways that we can continue to practice our faith is in our eight-week challenge. We are right in the midst of it, and it is incredible as we continue to soak the gospel together. So if you're looking for a way to continue to grow your faith, jump into our eight-week challenge, soak the gospel with us. It's going to be incredible. That's right, and we're also multi-ethnic, so please make sure you go to our site, especially the Center for Racial Reconciliation. Check that out, great things for you to see there. Yes, and as we are officially mm. in fall, uh, I'm so excited to announce that we are doing our Trunk or Treat, Saturday, October 30th, 10 a.m. to noon at Monrovia High School. It's the best kids in costumes, mm -hmm. adults in costumes, mm -hmm. trunks, candy, um, so please attend. But also, if you're looking for a way to serve, this is a great chance to jump in, host a trunk, or bring candy. The good stuff. The good stuff. Yeah, we need to, <laughs> we are taking candy donations. Uh, it's a great way to jump in, but trunk or treat, Saturday, October 30th, incredible. Oh, I'm still a kid at heart. I love that. Hey, listen, speaking of a kid at heart, I remember just as a kid, that's when I first learned how to play the guitar. And uh, any time that a good song would come on, I would grab my guitar and I'd sit in front of that song just as I'm preparing to do right now for worship. I always grab my guitar and say, hey, listen, I'm ready to engage and then open up my mind and my heart to what God has to say. So whatever it is that you need to do, let's do that right now as we prepare for worship. God is about to say something good to you. Yeah. Here we go. There's nothing left. Our love 
sings to you.
hello everybody. Hey, how y'all doing? Good to see you, good to see you, good to see you. How y'all doing? It is so good to be back with all of you um, as we've been going through our series, as we're living in a different world from where we come from. Uh, but in this world, we are to hold on with all we've got um, to our values, which are the gospel, being transformed by the gospel, uh, growing in a life of worship. And today we talk about gathering in community. It's one of our values. Now, now we've been practicing all along the way, been practicing studying God's word, practicing solitude, not all alone, but, uh, but, but all one, all becoming all one together, letting God do his thing. And I hope you've been joining us in the practice. Hey, if you haven't, you can jump on right now. We've been eight weeks, but hey, for you, it's going to be a four-week. We call it a four-week challenge uh, or, or whatever. So, so jump on. But the big goal is that we practice what we believe, that we will be a people of faith and intentional practice, and that what we believe will show up in how we believe. And that's our hope in our prayer. God, thank you so much for this time. Thank you for the privilege of being able to open up your word. Your children have gathered to gather to listen. So speak, O oh Lord, like only you can. Tune our ear to your voice so that we might hear you ever so clearly. Turn our heart toward you so that we might experience the fullness of all that you have for us. Uh, God, it's to that end that I ask that you stand in my body, think through my mind, speak through my vocal cords, those things you would have us say, know, and do. May the words of my mouth, the meditation of my heart be acceptable in thy sight. O oh Lord, you are my strength. You are my redeemer. Get glory in this place. Jesus name. Amen. There is a famous cartoon sketch uh, from the peanut gang. Uh, Y'all remember them, uh, Linus and Lucy. Uh, Lucy was an overbearing, uh, just say what you think kind of deal. And Linus was like this little passive little brother uh, that kind of did whatever was told to her. Linus was sitting there watching TV one day uh, and he's got the remote control in her hand. Lucy comes in, snatches the remote control out of his hand. Linus, in a, in a grab of courage, stands up against her. But then Lucy says, you see this hand? You, you see this? Now, individually, they're not that impressive. But when they come together, they create what I call a formidable foe. And she takes the remote and walks away. And Linus is sitting there left with himself and his thoughts. And he pulls up his hands and he looks at him and he says, why can't y'all come together like that? <laughs> <laughs> Why can't y'all come together like that? Jesus' prayer in the book of John is so interesting. This is a moment where Jesus takes time and he prays for his disciples. And if Jesus is praying for us, I, what is he praying for us? Like, I want to know, like, what is he praying for us? If Jesus, because what someone prays for you is indicative of their thoughts towards you, their hopes for you, their, their concerns for you, the warnings, like that's indicative of all of that. So as you listen to Jesus' prayer, we should perk up and say, this is what Jesus had in mind. This is what Jesus was concerned about. This was what was troubling his heart. This is what he was hoping for for us. In John 17, verse 20, he says, my prayer is not for them alone, his primary disciples, but I pray also for those who will believe in me through their message. That's us, y'all, uh, that all of them may be one. Father, just as you are in me and I am in you, may they also watch this. May they be in us so that the world may believe that you have sent me. 
them. I have given them the glory, the, the manifestation of God's great power and character. I have given them the glory that, that you gave me, the full display of God's character, his love, his grace. I've given them the glory that you gave me that they may be one as we are one. I've given them what they need to be one. I've given them what they need. I in them and you in me so that they may be brought to complete unity, brought to complete unity. It means it doesn't start complete, but he's going to bring us there. Then the world will know that you sent me and have loved them even as you have loved me. Father, I want those you have given me to be with me where I am and to see my glory, the glory that you have given me because you love me before the creation of the world. Righteous Father, though the world does not know you, I know you, and they know that you have sent me. Jesus' prayer for us is simply this. I wish they'd come together like this. I, I wish they'd come together because their greatest strength and the greatest demonstration of my power and my glory will be found in their unity. Will be found in their unity. I guess, church, I want to... I want to speak like Linus today. Why can't we come together like this? If God's greatest prayer for us was unity, Satan's greatest ploy against us is disunity. I'll say, I'll say that again. If God's greatest prayer for us is unity, he's saying, God, unity, may they be one. His, the, the, the prayer for the disciples, his greatest prayer was for unity. I'm telling you, Satan's greatest ploy against us is disunity. Look at the news. Look around. Whose strategy is winning? Church, why can't we come together like that? Because if we come together, we put on display the power of God's glory and we become a formidable foe in the earth. Yes. 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 Satan's ploy to divide us. I'm, I, I want to talk about, when we talk about here at Fellowship Gathering and Community, there are three passages the three pictures. This, this is one of them. The one in John is one of them where it just shapes our vision for how we see the family of faith and how it is we come together. It, it, it shapes how we come together. And I think there are three pictures that should mark our fellowship, uh, our community, um, our faith family and our ability to come together. Here's the thing though, as I preach it, and as I give you the vision forward, forward, I feel like this sermon is, is a warning. I, I feel like the posture of my heart as I've tried to put it together, it's, it's, it's a, a vision for how it's supposed to happen but a warning for what happens if it doesn't. I, our hearts should break for this value. Jesus is pleading and praying and saying, God, may they be one as we are one. May they have unity. May they be one. May they, may they be in us as I am in you. And may they know my, your love, God, because I know your love and I know your glory. May they know your love. May they know your glory. And may that translate to oneness, to unity. Lord, may it bring them all together. What if we miss the message? What happens if we, what's at stake? 
What's at stake if we don't get it? What's at stake if we ignore it? What's at stake if we follow everything else? If we, if we soap and sit in his word and if we spend time in solitude but come out and act like a fool? What, what's at stake? If we do all those practices but miss the unity, miss the oneness, miss, miss the very thing that Jesus prayed for. I don't know about you, but a lot's at stake and we're at risk of losing it all because we're more divided and more connected both at the same time. We're more connected than ever before. We're more connected. I can see people I ain't never even want to see again. I can see them again on my feet. There they go. I, didn't, I, I thought after sixth grade graduation, I'd never see them again. But there they go. I can see them and their grandkids all on my feet. I can see everybody. I'm more connected. I can see what you're doing. I can see what you're doing. I see where you went. I ain't even got to hear about your vacation. I saw it all. I saw it all. I followed all. I'm, we're more connected, but more divided, more hateful more angry whistleblower at Facebook exposing what we all know about social media. It breeds insecurity in comparison. And it, and it's hitting our, our girls, our, our little teenagers. We thought mean girls was something 20 years ago. Now, what does it mean not just to be bullied at school, but now bullied at home? You go online, you're bullied. Check the stats, y'all. We walk around here celebrating freedoms and rights and, and technology and all of this stuff and proud of everything. Look at the receipts. Suicide rate, higher than it's ever been. Depression, higher than it's ever been. People feeling like they're alone and by themselves and nobody understands them. Numbers are through the roof. Got a thousand followers, but no real friends. And I would love to say that that was impacting the world. But as I come to church, we ain't in a different world. We in the same world they in. The numbers are just as bad for believers in those who are supposed to be. This is if, if there's no other message that you need to hear that where we should be different than the world. It's this one. If this if, there, if there's no other one that you should get, we should be different from the world. We should be living in a different world. But y'all, we in the same world dealing with the same problems, bringing the same hate and the same anger in the same comment sections. Look at the comment sections. It's the Christians that are on there belligerent belittling no grace no kindness no love we're proponents of hate the worst thing about it we're doing it in the name of Jesus you're declaring your rights instead of declaring his righteousness which deems us all rightlessness we ain't got no rights. We are here through his righteousness. Therefore, we are marked by grace. Why? Because how we got here, we didn't earn it. And that shapes how we come together. But when the body's got their own right, when the thumb is like, I'm doing my own thing, bump y'all. I got my rights. I can do my own thing. I ain't got to come together with y'all. I'm doing y'all because the, the pinky finger ticked me off. He's always talking about all of that. And he's so thin and so tall. And I'm all short and thick and chunky. He's shaming me and going off on me. I'm sick of this. I ain't going to be bump him. I ain't never talking to him again. The middle finger like, well, the last time I stood up, everybody got offended. So it's like everybody, everybody all messed up. And God says, we'll never win playing that game. But when we come together, a formidable foe. So I want to talk about what's at stake. What's at stake? There's a picture in Revelation uh, 
chapter 7, verse 9. Um, it says, um, after this, I looked and there before me was a great multitude that no one could count from every nation, every tribe, people and language standing before the throne and before the Lamb of God. They were wearing white robes and were holding palm branches in their hands. Watch this, y'all. And they cried out in a loud voice. Salvation belongs to our God who sits on the throne and to the lamb. That's what's coming, y'all. We're going to be there. Jesus is going to come back. And all things will be made right. And we're going to be standing there and it's going to be every tribe, every tongue, every race, every nation. And we're going to be all there. This big, great celebration and sitting in the middle. There it'll be. Oh, the King of Kings, the Lord of Glory, the Lamb of God, high and lifted up on his throne. And we'll all be saying with one voice, worthy is the Lamb that was slain. Salvation belongs to our God. On that day, child, every knee shall bow and every tongue shall confess that Jesus Christ is Lord. Oh, what a day. What a day. Just think about every nation, every tribe. Every tongue, every race. Yeah. You ever think about what language we're going to be speaking? Yeah. <laughs> you ever thought about that? Like, you, y- y'all thought we were just going to be speaking English, didn't you? <laughs> That's what we think, don't we? Just, oh, it's just going to be English. It's going to be like the dominant language is going to be English. No, we don't know. what. We, I don't know how we're going to pull it off. Right. But we all going to be saying the same thing. Yeah. The Pentecostals is like, we're going to be speaking in tongues. We was right the whole time. Y'all should have listened to us. <laughs> we're going to be speaking in tongues. Y'all should have got your spiritual language. <laughs> It, it's this beautiful picture, and that's eternity. And if we're going to stand around the throne, why can't we sit around the same table? Amen. And what's at stake if we don't live now? Yeah. Like we'll be called to dwell then. What happens if we miss the diversity of the kingdom of God? That's why around here, we, when we gather together, we want to intentionally gather together with people that don't look alike, don't live alike, and don't vote alike. Because that's who we're going to spend eternity with. Yeah. It says, we're gonna, do you think we all going to be voting the same? We all voted the same way. We all got the same views. No, it's going to be a big old melting pot of just about everything. I don't think if we don't practice now, how are we going to be prepared for heaven? So you know what's at stake? Us not being prepared for eternity. What's at stake is us not experiencing the fullness of what God's family brings to the table. Mm -hmm. What happens if we just live with people that look like us, live like us, and vote like us? And we prove to have no love, no tolerance, and no capacity to sit with people that don't agree with us. Mm -hmm. You know what? Hell might be a better option for you because you will literally be so frustrated with the diversity of heaven. You might appreciate hell a little bit more. I know y'all like, uh, hell no. (laughs) Oh, my wife is going to kill me for that joke. Um, But no, I'm not cussing. It's literally hell no. Hell no, I'm denying that option. But here's the hard thing. How are you going to deny the option with eternity, but you accept the option now? Do you see how that can be confusing? It's like, why, you, why do you want to be all up in heaven now? And on earth, you had an opportunity to practice and participate in that. But you wanted no parts of it. But now did you change your mind? No, I... I so people, people look at God and just saying, hell is just this evil thing that he does. No, no, no. It, like, if you don't want to spend time with God's vision and God's purpose now, why are you going to change your mind then? You got an opportunity to walk in the fullness of every tribe, every tongue, every race. Most of us in most parts of the country, in most parts of places, unless you live in a very you know, secluded, exclusive neighborhood, and some of, some of you do, even in that, they're still laced in diversity. And we live in a global world. You can still expand your cultural uh, uh, competency with what you study, with what you read, with what you listen to, with how you're shaped. 
I just struggle. We're just so used to being around white people. We're so used to being around Asian people. So used to being around black people. We're so used to being around who we're comfortable with. We're going to miss who we've been called to be with. Do you understand what I'm saying? So around here, that's a big value for us. And to be honest, it's one of the hardest ones. Because we live in a time now where you're incentivized not to be with each other. We incentivize not to come together. Don't look alike. Don't live alike. Don't vote alike. Oh, you are highly incentivized not to live like that. Mm-hmm. Not to live like that. Because most of us, I, you, you've, if we're to be honest, your pastors are Don Lemon, Chris Cuomo, Rachel Maddow, and Sean Hannity, mm-hmm. Tucker Carson. Those are your pastors because you've been more discipled by their ideologies than you have been the power of Jesus Christ. Why? Number one, you watch more of them than you read the word of God. Number two, you articulate their perspective more than you articulate the kingdom perspective. And you defend your rights based off of their understandings more than you defend the power of the gospel of Jesus Christ. Let's just tell the truth. Well, Albert, how can you say that? Because I went to your Facebook and Instagram page and I read your post. And I've seen your comments on other people. Come on, let's just be honest. We're being discipled by CNN, MSNBC, Fox, and we are no longer being discipled by the B-I-B-L-E. And it's ripping the church apart. You know how many people have left churches because of masks and vaccinations? If Jesus' greatest prayer was for unity, Satan's greatest ploy is disunity. Have you become a victim of the ploy? And not the answer to the prayer. Are you busy packing up and and leaving with anti-vax and anti-mask? Or are you are you running away because you can't believe people not going to get vaccinated? You can't believe they don't want to marry. Are you so indignant and so so frustrated and so angry? That you're leaving the family table. And exercising your right to. See, we got to be careful. It's a very dangerous thing, especially with this political thing. And I know they tell you you shouldn't talk about politics, but, you know, I just don't know no better. Um, (laughs) It's a dangerous thing when uh, your 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 religion uh, gets in bed with politics. It gives birth to a baby that we call Americanity. It's the mixture of American politics and Christianity in this mixture of, of, of nationalism, patriotism and Christianity that make, makes for a terrible baby, for an ugly baby. It just, it's just an ugly baby. It ain't pretty at all. It's like, oh, look at my baby, Americanity. It looks evil. It looks disgusting. It needs to be rebuked in the name of Jesus. But some of you, you've, caught, you've fallen victim to it. And I'm telling you, you want to talk about a terrible mix? Mm -hmm. Trying to wrap that American flag around the cross of Jesus Christ. Mm. Now, I love America, but let me tell you something. On that day, it's going to be every nation, every tribe, every tongue, and every race. And America ain't going to have a VIP section. And the cross will be unhinged with anybody's flag, Mm. with anybody's nationalism, because we're of a different world. It's going to be marked with the kingdom of God. And around here at Fellowship, that's a really big value. How do we, how do we live that out? By sitting with one another, listening with, with one another, seeing one another. Being uncomfortable and being okay with being offended so that we might love one another well. Our compassion goes past our conviction. Did you hear that? Our compassion goes past our conviction. So I know I got this deep conviction about about CRT, critical race theory, although 10 minutes ago I didn't even know what it was. And now I got a deep (laughs) conviction about it. I can't even explain it, but I got a deep conviction. But if someone wants to just tell their story about their experience, your compassion says, I'm willing to sit and listen to you. 
and I'm willing to empathize with you. If you're a black man that's experienced racial injustice, I'm not willing to label or categorize or discredit your perspective because it looks and sounds like some theory that I can't explain. Where's the grace? Where's the love? The family means I sit with someone that I completely disagree with. They, they, you, you, a, you a Biden Ross Perot supporter uh, and they a MAGA Trump supporter. It means you can both sit at the same table, surrender your red hat, surrender your blue label for the crucified cross because the center of our table is bloodstained. And it's not marked by an elephant. It's not marked by a donkey. It's marked by a lamb. And that's what we all surrender to. And we celebrate that diversity. We hold on to it and we work hard through offense, through discomfort, through conviction so that we might hold on to compassion and wrestle with the biblical ethic to say, Lord, it all has to be washed by your blood. And we come together in diversity and we fight for that diversity. We fight for that table because that's what eternity will feel like. And if we're going to do it forever, that means we should start practicing right now. So I'm practicing right now. I'll hurry through. I can talk about this all day. Uh, this, this, this value of gathering together should be shaped by diversity. Number two, it should be shaped by radical generosity. Yes. Radical generosity. Yeah. Acts chapter two, verse 42. They devoted themselves to the apostles teaching and the fellowship to the breaking of bread and to prayer. Everyone who was filled with awe. Uh, at the many wonders and signs performed by the apostles. All the believers were together and had, watch this, everything in common. They sold property and possessions to give to one another who had need. Every day they continued to meet together in the temple courts. They broke bread in their homes and ate together with glad and sincere hearts praising God and enjoying the favor of all the people. And the Lord added to their number daily those who were being saved. Y'all, Jesus had got up from the grave. Holy Spirit had filled him. And the direct impact of that was them coming together and seeing one another, seeing the diversity that was there, but not just seeing the diversity, but seeing the needs that were there. Here I am, I got more than enough food and they ain't got none. Come to my table, come and sit with me. They shared their resources. If I got it, you got it. If you got it, I got it. If y'all got it, we got it. There was a sense of oneness. So in the midst of this crazy diversity, it didn't actually divide us. It pulled us together and brought out a radical generosity. Because when you've been given something so radically generous, then you become radically generous. And they had been giving a love, been given a love from Jesus Christ that was so radical, that was so generous, that the direct impact, I ain't got no choice but to be generous because Jesus has been so generous to me. So how could I not welcome you when he welcomed me? How could I not invite you in when he invited me in? How could I not help supply your need when he supplied my need? Because of what he's doing for me, we got to do it for one another. That's what happens to the body when we come together. So when we gather together as community, there's a sense that we see one another, not just the well put together version of yourself, but the brokenness. We see the hardship. We see the rough places and we come alongside one another. We love one another. That's why I ain't about to fight over no vaccine. I'm too busy loving you. We, because we've been given something so great. We give to one another something that's been so great. I love it because it says the favor of all the people and just enjoying the favor of the people. You know what happens in good Christian community? We just enjoy the favor. When somebody gets get a house, we feel like we all just got a house. When, when, When somebody experiencing the loss of a loved one, we're all experiencing the loss of a loved one. It's the favor of the people. 
How do we get there? We devote ourselves to the, te- to the teachings of Jesus. We don't devote ourselves to MSNBC. We don't devote ourselves to Rachel Meadow or Don uh, or, or Hannity. We, invote, we, we devote ourselves to the apostles' teaching. What are we sitting under? What are we sitting in? What are we allowing to feed our hearts and our minds? What's feeding our perspectives? The word of God, not the word of Rachel Maddow, her sweet self. And I ain't hating on none of y'all. Y'all can come to the church. I love to hang out with y'all. I buy your coffee. I love to fellowship with you. So and I ain't mad at it. I ain't mad at them. I'm, I'm mad at us. Because who we are inviting them and allowing them to become. Y'all, we got to get ourselves together. Why can't we come together like that? So what's at stake if we don't do it? That means on our watch, people will go unseen, unfed, uncovered, unloved. What a shame for him to love us so much. And for us to love so little. For him to love us so much. And for us to love so little. You want to you you see something scary? Look at Matthew 25. Mm. Jesus says, if you think you're going to be in my family and love the poor little, love the, the prisoner with little, love the, the, the homeless and the, un, the unfed little, you got nothing. You, you, you're going to have a hard time getting in. We don't like verses like that, but he just makes it plain. He's like, yo, because what you've done to the least of these, you've done to me. What is he saying? He's saying, I and you, you and me, we are one. So if you ignore one, you've ignored us all because we're all one. So he's saying you got to get it. All the diversity, all the tribes, all the nations, all the demographics, all the socioeconomics, we're one. So what you're doing to them, what you're saying to them, what they're experiencing matters. If there's injustice over there, it matters to the whole. We've got to be honest. Tell the truth about our pain and then we get to respond to it. But if you set up a system that you ain't even going to hear my pain because it ain't real. And you can't, I can't even tell you my story. I can't even tell you my burden. I can't even tell you my discrimination. And if I do, it's minimized and discredited. No, I'm not telling my truth to make you feel bad. I'm telling you my truth because that's my truth. That's my experience. That's my story. And the goal ain't for you to feel bad. The goal is for us to feel one. How are we going to feel one if you can't feel me? That's that's empathy, y'all. That's empathy. How are we going to feel one? How are we going to answer Jesus' prayer if you ain't going to feel me? And I'm not willing to feel you. And it's in that. Ah, that we feel God and we feel the fullness of oneness and we become, become. Remember, he brings us to oneness. He, he brings us to completeness in him. Uh, he completes the unity in him. Remember that idea? We, we, it is in that that we go on the journey of becoming one through hard conversations, through Holy Spirit field confrontations, through through. Through, through the disagreements and surrendering and alignments, through forgiving, through offense, through forgiveness, we become one. Third and finally, that you got this picture of every tribe, every tongue, every nation, and the beauty of diversity. You got this radical generosity. And then finally, you've, you've got this undeniable witness undeniable witness. Go back to John 17 and let's look at verse 25 again. That last verse. John 17 verse 25 or 24. I think it's 24 or 25 somewhere in there. Listen to this. He says, this is how uh, Father, I want those you have given me to be with me where I am and to see my glory the glory that you have given me because you loved me before the creation of the world. Okay, next verse. Righteous Father, though the world does not know you, I know you, and they know that you have sent me. Y'all, it is through our witness. It is through our oneness. 
It is through our ability to come together that the world will know. What's at stake if we don't do it? The world won't know. The world needs to look at us, the church, and see our oneness, see our unity, see our love in the midst of diversity, in the midst of different opinions and perspectives. They ought to look at us and say, what in the world is going on over there? Jesus must be real. Can you look at you see the Asian folk, Latino folk, uh, Indian folk, uh, black folks, white folk, all coming together, loving folks, and look at them. I know he voted for Hillary. I know she voted for Trump. Look at them. They both worshiping and crying at the same altar. What in the world? world is going on. It's our greatest witness. Therefore, it's Satan's greatest ploy. It's an old song that says, and they'll know we are Christians by our love. Our love, and they'll know we are Christians by our love. We gather together in community here at Fellowship, and it's a value here in this world because it is in our gathering where we are seen, known, loved, and cared for. It is in our gathering that we practice what it is to love one another. People that don't look alike, don't live like us, don't vote like us. We practice even enemy love, even our enemies. Mm -hmm. He says, practice that love. It is in our gathering and our ability to love all our siblings and our ability to see and to serve all of our siblings that we send a message to the world that Jesus Christ is real and they know he's real by seeing our love and knowing that it's real. So we gather to be a witness to the world. Jesus is real and his love is real to us, in us, through us for his glory. Amen. Amen. This friend, most beautiful, most beautiful, oh, dearest Father, closest friend, most beautiful, most beautiful, sing, dearest Father, dearest Father, my closest friend, closest friend, most beautiful. Most beautiful.
closest friend, most beautiful, most beautiful, dearest father, closest friend, most beautiful, most beautiful. Would you just pray a prayer of thanks with me? Father, thank you for that word. Thank you that um, we have a better understanding of what it means to be gathered in community. Thank you for what uh, you have surfaced, and we do look forward to putting that in place. We give you praise in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Listen, uh, we want you to know that we are here for you. Whether it's counseling, tangible help, in any way, we've always got somebody available to you. So reach out to us. We'd love to help. Absolutely. And we'd love to see you guys get connected. And that's one of those ways we ask two questions. Who are you doing life with and where are you serving? Uh, if you're looking to get connected in the community, we have incredible community groups that are meeting right now for you to jump into. And volunteering, we need you. You are part of this beautiful body of Christ. And so if you're looking for incredible ways to volunteer, we hope to see you jump in. We also know that continuing to give, it is a blessing. It's an, it's an honor to be able to give back to God's church. And we know that as we give, it is an act of worship um, and it, it changes us. It's, it's very much the heart of God. And so as we take this chance to give back to God's church, um, we just want to say thank you for doing that. We also want to let you know that uh, the number that you use to give has changed. So check it out on the screen. Um, take this opportunity for it to be a holy moment to give back to God's church. That's right. And please stay connected with us. Um, it's really great if you get the app. I know that that one really works well for me. <laughs> but go ahead, stay connected with us. Yeah. We want to hear from you. We want you to know that we're here for you as well, too. And finally, we just want to say thank you, Fellowship Church, for being here with us. We love you. We just are so thankful every weekend you show up. Uh, we pray that this week is incredible and just God's blessings upon you. Have a great week, everybody. We'll see you next time. Bye now.